All right. Well, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? I um, want to just start off by saying welcome. Thank you so much for attending our session. Uh, we are really excited to be participating in SOCAP. Um, it's such an energizing gathering. And especially um, during the COVID pandemic, um, it's really nice to still have this opportunity to connect. Um, I'll start off by introducing our panelists. Today we have Kimberly Black King. She is Senior Vice President of Housing Development with Volunteers of America National Services. Volunteers of America National Services is a national nonprofit organization that advances, supports, promotes, and administers health, housing, and supportive services. We have Andy Phillips, co-founder and managing partner of Maycomb Capital, a new impact investing platform under which she is launching the Community Outcomes Fund, the first U.S. outcomes-based financing fund. We also have Andrea Ponzer, CEO of Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future. SAFE is a nonprofit collaborative of 13 multi-state nonprofit affordable housing providers who own more than 140 affordable rental homes. Uh, we have a slight change uh, to our panel today. My colleague Andy McMahon had a last minute conflict and is unable to join us. Um, so I will be moderating today's session and also filling in uh, with United Healthcare's perspective. Um, so I am Eleanor Bieber. I'm Director of Social Impact Strategy with United Healthcare Community and State. United Healthcare Community and State is a division of United Health Group that provides high quality public sector healthcare programs in 31 states and Washington, D.C. Um, so we're interested in uh, hearing where you're joining from. So uh, if, you, if you'd like to, please feel, to put that, feel free to put that in the chat. And then also we plan to save time at the end for questions, um, but please put them in the chat along the way so that we can get to as many of them as possible. So our session today will focus on building investment partnerships between healthcare, housing, and social service organizations with the goal of improving health in communities. There's growing evidence of the important role of social determinants of health and wellness, of social determinants of health and health and wellness. It's estimated that about 80% of health outcomes are attributable to the social determinants of health. And that's broadly defined as health behaviors socioeconomic factors and environmental factors. So things like housing and employment and social support are important to health and well-being. And during our session today, we'd like to share examples about how we are currently collaborating together to improve health in communities, discuss health-focused cross-sector partnerships, highlight healthcare as an investor, and then share early lessons learned, including how COVID-19 has impacted this work. So with that, oh, and it's great to see all the uh, chats of where everyone's coming in from. Um, to our panelists, I'd love if we could go around um, and if you could tell the audience a little bit more about your organization and your role. Um, Kimberly, why don't we start with you? Getting off mute as step one. So good afternoon, <laughs> everyone, or morning, depending on where you're based. Um, so Kimberly Black King, I'm our Senior Vice President for Real Estate Development at Volunteers of America National Services, VONES for short. Um, so VONES, as um, uh, Eleanor said, is a nonprofit. Um, we're a faith-based nonprofit. Um, we are national in our scope. We develop and own affordable housing. So that is housing for low-income individuals and seniors and families. Um, we have housing that is dedicated to um, the folks with special needs as well. And we have a focus on veterans in addition to that. Um, the other side of our business is a healthcare line. So we provide healthcare to seniors. We operate over 40 healthcare programs. Um, and that ranges from skilled nursing facilities to assistant living, to PACE programs, to adult daycare. There's a whole range of programs. So um, I am on the housing side and um, we recently have um, sort of work to break down the silos between our housing and our health care side so we could share that expertise. Um, my team um, actually just oversees the um, uh, sort of bricks and mortar components of the uh, development. So from soup to nuts, getting an acquisition or a new development, new construction built um, to um, uh, stabilization, losing it up. And once that's done, um, we turn it over to operations. 
Um, we're, what we're starting to do now with our team is connect more with our healthcare side of the business and make sure that we have healthcare outcomes that are identified early on um, and targeted for our new, new developments. Thank you, Kimberly. Andrea Ponzer, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Andrea Ponzer. I'm the CEO of Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future. We call ourselves SAFE. And as Eleanor said, we're a collaborative of 13 very large nonprofit affordable housing developers, including Volunteers of America. Our members own about 148,000 rental homes at about 2,000 properties around the country. They're in every state except North Dakota, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and Washington, D.C. Um, here at SAFE, we bring together those members and lift up the best practices and policy ideas for creating and preserving homes that connect people to opportunity and well-being. So that means drawing on practice to understand what the challenges are to both creating homes and having people flourish there. And with that, we make policy recommendations, not just in housing, but where housing connects with health, thinking about how you can use service coordination and partnerships across sectors to give people the opportunity to close some of the equity gaps we see in so many communities. So we do that by working with funding partners, with Congress, with federal agencies, and lifting up practices at the state and local level as well. Thanks, Andrea. Andy, would you like to go ahead? Sure, thank you, Eleanor, and thank you for sort of pulling together uh, this wonderful panel. Um, even if Andy McMahon couldn't be the third version of the name Andrew or Andrea to be on this panel. Um, so um, Make Home Capital is an impact investing platform. I launched the Community Outcomes Fund and Make Home Capital about four years ago uh, after spending six years at Goldman Sachs, where I both led Goldman's social impact bond investments, what I would now call outcomes financing, um, as well as Goldman's social impact fund. Um, I decided to launch this new fund because I really uh, believe in the power of uh, harnessing public-private partnerships to address uh, investments in human capital rather than just physical infrastructure. Um, I think Eleanor did a great job at the beginning of the panel really talking about the social determinants of health. And that is really what our goal is, is to work in communities to help expand high quality human and social service programs uh, to help folks access economic opportunity and address poverty. The goal is really to align local spending uh, with social outcomes and using private capital um, as we've seen for decades in the housing space to drive social impact we are doing the same um, in the social and, and human services uh, arena. Uh, we, uh, as I said, I launched the fund about four years ago, and I am very pleased to share with the um, SOCAP audience today um, that United Health Services has now made a $10 million commitment to the fund. Uh, joining about 12 other limited partners, bringing us to a total of around $60 million of capital. So we are very um, excited about this partnership, um, not least because we really feel like um, as we began talking about uh, United investing in the fund, what was immediately clear to us was the alignment of our goals around addressing the social determinants of health and a commitment to really partnering with local communities. Um, so excited to be able to share that today. Wonderful. Um, Thank you, Andy. I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, with uh, your audio, but I think it's just my um, connection. So hopefully it'll pop back in soon. If not, I may try to exit and enter at a, at a specific point. But um, so, so thanks everyone. Lastly, I'm Eleanor Bieber with United Healthcare Community and State, and Community and State serves the Medicaid population. Um, so that's primarily folks who are low income, both individuals and families, um, seniors, people with disabilities, um, and people experiencing homelessness. So really a wide, a very diverse um, population. Uh, we have about 6 million members in states across the country. And in my role, I work with our health plan, health plan leaders on developing partnerships that address 
social determinants of health, and also with our United Health Group Every team on our social impact investment work. Um, and we're working to invest dollars in initiatives that improve health in communities. We have uh, a longer history of investments in affordable housing. Continue to have a strong commitment um, in that area, but we're in the process of expanding that portfolio. Um, and we're, we feel really fortunate to work with um, such great partners, SAFE and VOA, um, on our recently announced Health and Housing Fund, and then of course also with Andy Phillips on the Make Home Community Outcomes Fund. Um, so I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, first, let's dig a little bit deeper into the topic of health and housing. Um, Andrea and Kimberly, you touched on this a little bit um, in your introductions, but how do stewards of affordable housing for the future and volunteers of America think about the connection between housing and health? I can start if you want. Yeah, um, that'd be great. So you know, as a collaborative of real estate developers, we were pretty early to recognize that housing is a fulcrum for health, that you can leverage in other interventions to, to improve health if you just have a stable home. Housing instability itself, including things like being behind on rent, having multiple moves, or ultimately becoming homeless is associated with a host of adverse outcomes. For instance, if you lack affordability and a family moves into crowded conditions, you start to see kids with impacts, higher risk for injuries, blood pressure, respiratory conditions, and exposure to infectious disease, much like what we're seeing play out right now with COVID-19. And on the flip side, we found that children, or it's been found that children in low-income families that get housing assistance are more likely to get access to adequate nutrition and perform well on well-child visits. So we're real estate developers, and when we think about all of this, we begin with affordable homes, and we come together to think about those practices that help us leverage housing into other things that support well-being. So we're trying to think really systemically, not just anecdotally in how you connect people. There are a lot of great partnerships out there thinking about, okay, well, we have housing and we can bring in some, some healthcare or some preventative things, and that, that's wonderful. But we want to ask the question of how can you use the scale of rental housing, not just having 50 or 100 or 200 families in one place, but what if you owned a portfolio all over the country? What could you do to really start unlocking partnerships? There are certainly opportunities to reduce healthcare costs, and our members are, are working on a lot of those through partnerships that you know bring in both preventative care and, and things that are more responsive. But we're trying to really think upstream to those social determinants of health, and particularly as they connect to home. So that stability, education, community safety, sense of agency, and the support of the community as well. When we think about stability, we think about the affordability of the home, but not just what the rent is, things like how high are your utilities? Is your home stable and comfortable, and can you afford to keep it that way over time? Um, and, and this is a place where we're finding new partners like United Health Group and, and others every day to provide new resources to create just more units of affordable housing. Then we think about how healthy is that housing? What are the materials we use to build it? And what is its impact on the surrounding community? What are the carbon emissions? What, how does it contribute to population health? And then how we connect people to other supports. And that's where we're forging a lot of partnerships right now. You can do that just by locating housing well, where there's a lot in the community, but also by bringing in service coordination and someone that can help people connect to what they need and close some of those equity gaps in communities that have been disinvested and, and disconnected by centuries of systemically racist policy. And that can be connecting people to preventative health, nutrition supports, education after school programming, financial coaching, and you know whatever else they need and, and where the community is lacking or can provide something just with that bridge. But this hasn't been something that's been paid for. So we think a lot about how do we bridge that gap and create health by providing that connective tissue between residents and community. We have about six years ago started a community of practice that came up with a framework of how do we as property operators think about this and build this into our DNA. So we're thinking constantly about how you serve residents, starting first with what they tell you they want. Um, and then once you have that in place, also measuring outcomes. Out of that, we've started thinking about, it. We, and we now operate a certification program that thinks about how do we identify those partners that are doing this on a systems level and being accountable for the outcomes they're creating. And this focus on that intersection that isn't just health outcomes and, and healthcare data, but a more holistic sort of sense of things is what's helped us forge partnerships, not just with United, but members are working with other payers on, on sort of more localized partnerships. And then we're also working with Fannie Mae on an outcomes driven partnership to, to provide that service coordination factor. Thanks, Andrea. 
Kimberly, how about for you with Volunteers of America? Um, it, we work very closely with SAFE. As Andrea said, we're um, one of the members of, of the SAFE Coalition. So we um, work very closely with her. So I echo a lot of her comments. Um, and we, we agree that you know, there's an absolute connection um, and that you know, housing is one of those core essentials. Um, and it's very difficult to focus on some of those other issues when you don't have stable housing. Um, in the communities that we serve, um, we typically serve underserved communities. So we're seeing those, um, those, um, those elements of, you know, lack of leading with the lack of access to quality, affordable housing, um, along with, you know, high unemployment, um, education, um, poor nutrition, um, health deserts, food deserts, all of those things in the communities that we serve. So um, that's never a surprise for us. Um, you know, I think that, you know, historically we have, you know, talked about health and, or, and housing being so connected that people will say, oh, well, health, housing is health care or housing is a prescription for health care. And um, we fully agree and subscribe to that. Um, but now we have to really sort of figure out how do we demonstrate, and as Andrea said, how do we pay for some of these things, right? So um, our real focus is on how do we expand our partnerships? And we think it's absolutely necessary for you know, us folks in the affordable housing industry to think more broadly about who we're partnering with. Um, you know, I've sat on the real estate side for 20 years. So you know, when I think about who my partners are, they are capital partners to help me get a building built, right? So they're banks, they're investors. Um, but you know, we really have to think about if we're going to partner with some of these adjacent sectors, who some of those more um, uh, uh, unusual suspects are that may be very good um, partners. So, for example, we partnered with um, AARP to do a demonstration um, to demonstrate how Alexis could help um, address social isolation and some of the adverse health outcomes that we see with seniors who are, you know, social isolate in their units. Um, and our portfolio is about 70% um, seniors. So um, it, there's research that shows that Alexa's and similar um, uh, tools like that are used as companions, right? So um, that AARP is not a very sort of organic, natural partner that would come to mind for us, but it is an awesome mm -hmm. opportunity. So, you know, here we are thinking about not only um, how we can address the health outcome for our residents, but it also got us thinking about um, how we're going to serve our residents in the future and how technology may change. So, um, in short, we um, Wi-Fi retrofitted um, some of our buildings um, to to put Wi-Fi throughout the building, um, drop Alexas in the units, and this enables to engage us to engage with the residents differently, right? So, um, yeah. It, Long gone are the days where we put a flyer on and the the, uh, the resident's door and say senior yoga at one o'clock. Um, you know, now we have to be much more engaging. So mm -hmm. we can say, hello, Kimberly, don't forget senior yoga is today at, at one o'clock. Senior yoga is in 30 minutes. Um, you know, we can hear from property management that the number one call that they get is, is the mail there yet? And so we can say with the flip of a switch, slip, uh, switch. Kimberly, your mail is here. So all of those things are very helpful to keep. They sound small, but they add up and they're helpful in keeping um, residents engaged um, and and moving and um, addressing that isolation. So um, those are the sort of partnerships that we're thinking about as we um, expand on, you know, beyond we know that there is an absolute connection, but how do we build and um, and bring some of these things to scale? Mm hmm. Thank you. So and I think especially you, Kimberly, touched on this um, a little bit in your answer already. But how has um, your thinking around the connection between housing and health or your kind of how your organization thinks about it? How has that changed over time in terms of the partnerships you're thinking about or, um, you know, even even having it as a priority? You know, with from a healthcare lens, I think for us it, it's newer to think about it in those terms. Can really you say um, housing is healthcare? I think that's something that we're thinking about too. I'm curious if this is something that's 
um, you know, been true for a long time with your organizations, or if this is kind of newer partnerships or newer priorities that you're identifying? So um, some of the partnerships are new, um, but the concept is not. Um, as I said um, earlier, so we have housing expertise on one side of the organization and healthcare expertise on the other. And we have for years operated in that way and housing did its thing mm -hmm. and healthcare did its thing. Um, so it wasn't, um, it was more, more by sort of um, coincidence that we would create some great, you know, model that we would be working together, but it wasn't intentional. So I think that um, the, the intent and the focus on it um, and the priority is what's changed over time. So we've always known there are very mm -hmm. positive healthcare outcomes with housing. Um, we have about 130 resident coordinators um, providing services to about 160 of our senior buildings. So, um, so we have a lot of data on um, how effective the resident coordinators that do things like provide um, um, assistance to getting benefits, um, coordinate activities with residents. So they do all of those um, uh, uh, broker providers to come in and do some preventative care things. So about 95% of our residents participate in our resident coordinator service program. Um, we've seen our retention rates um, at 86% for um, our residents that are able to age in place. So we know that our, our residents are staying healthier longer. So it's information that we've had. Um, two things that we've asked ourselves, if we know that model works and it's important, right, then how can we bring that to scale? Our resident coordinators are paid with um, HUD grants and we don't have that access in all of the properties that we're doing. So we have, you know, over 500 properties. So um, we don't have the um, access to HUD funding for all of those. So the question is, okay, what sort of partners do we need to have at the table so that we can bring this very uh, useful um, asset to our projects? Um, and so we, we did a couple of things over the past 18 months to help this come to fruition. Um, one, we hired a vice president of housing and healthcare initiatives. And so this was um, a recognition that, you know, I do real estate, healthcare people do healthcare, we need somebody to help tie it together. And so that's her role. So before we engage on any project, um, the real estate development team sits down with her and we start talking about the neighborhood that we're looking at. We talk about the most recent community needs assessment that was done in that neighborhood to see what the needs are, who's currently providing services, where the gaps are, who some potential partners might be, who potential providers might be, and how we might want to design that space to incorporate those partners. Um, so that's one thing which has been really great. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we did in February, our board approved um, our most recent strategic plan, and it has four goals. Um, the very first goal is innovative housing and healthcare. The second is well being. The third is partnerships. So the partnerships is really designed to help us achieve the innovative housing and healthcare and the well being, um, which we are putting metrics around what that means. And then the fourth is um, dedicating resources to our infrastructure to make sure that we are prepared to achieve these goals. So um, our board has really put and senior leadership has really put a lot of effort and commitment behind it. And that means a lot. So the organization is on the same page and that means a lot in you know, making sure that you know, we're able to achieve our goals. Um, I'll mention one other thing that, that we did as well. Um, we had, um, uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, uh, or it may have been you, Eleanor, that mentioned the um, health and housing fund so we're, we're, mm -hmm. that's what one of the things that we're starting to think about historically on the real estate side of the house. You know, we've raised capital for um, acquisitions of you know development sites and things like that, um, buildings for app rehab, um, but not necessarily intended for health and housing outcome initiatives. So um, I'd say that's the third thing that we're, we're being very intentional about. Um, and, and that's a great segue, Kimberly. Uh, Andrea, I'd love if you could uh, maybe share a little bit about the Health and Housing Fund um, that we recently launched. 
Sure. So this is a, a partnership between SAFE, our affiliate organization, the National Affordable Housing Trust, that syndicates low-income housing tax credit investments. So these are credits that are available to developers like Kimberly when they have a property that will serve people of modest income for a period of 30 years. And those tax credits can then be syndicated or sold to investors that are looking for that tax benefit over time and interested in having an impact on how their dollars are spent. This fund is a $100 million investment by United in those tax credits to contribute to the building of affordable homes. But in addition to that, and this has happened before, this is not United's first foray into this space and there are other healthcare actors doing similar things. What is very unique about this fund though, is the investment that has been made in resident services that goes with it. All of the properties in this fund will be invited to submit proposals for additional funding that helps catalyze unique resident services that improve the wellness and well-being of people living in these properties. And so my organization, SAFE, is administering those funds and helping organizations craft those proposals and think about how we're gonna track outcomes. So Eleanor and I will be working together for the next five or six years watching how life is going for the people living in these properties as they come online and these service innovations um, come into being. We've identified four or five core outcomes and this builds on work SAFE has been doing over the last five or six years. Our members are collecting outcomes, how life is going in terms of access to healthcare, how people are feeling, feelings of safety in the community, income, employment, housing stability. It's uh, five categories, 25 measures being collected across our portfolio. And we've drawn on that experience to build a much smaller set of outcomes um, that we're looking at for different measures being implemented through the fund. Thanks. And, and I just to add on to that a little bit, I think you really called out the things that we're most excited about with the fund um, being the the dollars available to support the services. You know, you, you had said that that's one of the things that there sometimes isn't enough funding for. There is there are not dollars available for. And, you know, I think we're aligned in our, um, you know, mission and prioritizing both the housing side, but also what in addition beyond that can help support um, health and help the residents be as healthy as possible. And then also too, that, you know, evaluation structure and understanding, um, you know, what is the impact? I think there's, you know, there's strong literature, there's strong evidence about the impact of housing on health, but understanding the impact of this work specifically, um, including the, you know, the interventions and the additional projects um, through the services fund um, is really, really exciting to us. You know, I, I think it's important to note too that, and we're really excited to see that United's taken a broad view of this and said like, look, don't just think you hire a coordinator and it has to be this and they're gonna take blood pressure. Really take that resident-centered approach and think about what the community needs and what might catalyze other partnerships. And so we look forward to seeing as these properties come through the development pipeline, a dozen or more of them in the next couple of years, what folks will come up with and, and what benefits we'll see from residents and creative ideas. Great. Well, let's uh, change gears a little bit um, and turn our attention to pay for success interventions um, and specifically those impacting health. Um, Andy, I'd love to pose a few questions to you. And then I think what I'm going to do, because my audio, I'm still not able to hear you. Um, I'm going to duck out and sign back in while you're answering. And hopefully then we can continue the dialogue. So I'd love to hear, um, I'd love if you could share with the audience. Um, what are the interventions that have been tested in a pay for success format that show promising results for health? And then also, um, if you could tell us a little bit about the Community Outcomes Fund um, and how uh, we're partnering together. Sure. Um, thank you, Eleanor, and good luck. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, there are, a, a number of interventions where pay for success has been successful that are related to health. And I can talk about a few examples. Some are sort of direct health invent, interventions and others are really more broadly addressing the social determinants of health. But if you take a step back, success, Eleanor? Nope. <laughs> Um, if you take a step back and think about what do we mean, what is the goal of pay for success? It's really tied to the fact that government is the largest purchaser of services for people who are poor and disadvantaged. Um, 
estimates put that spend at eight hundred billion to a trillion dollars. And that is with a Democrat in the White House, with a Republican in the White House, it really stays at that level of scale. The problem that pay for success and outcomes financing seeks to solve is the oftentimes disconnect between how those dollars are spent and the actual impact and goals. Um, and using the structure of a public-private partnership to align those things. We're used to these types of structures when government wants to build a bridge, right? They enter into an agreement with the private sector, the private sector builds the bridge, and then the government, the sponsoring government, pays a use fee for the next 35 years or an availability fee that then repays the investment of the private sector. But if the bridge isn't there, the sponsoring government doesn't pay. Oftentimes when people talk about funding human services, they talk about it as a pay and pray model where government enters into a contract based on a budget and the dollars flow based on how much money has been spent rather than whether or not the impact the intended impact has been achieved so we really launched the community outcomes fund to help bring the capital to communities that would enable these new public private partnerships or relatively new circling back to healthcare um, when you really think about the social determinants of health and sort of what you really mean in that sense is upstream investment um, most of our projects, if not all, are related to addressing issues around health. Um, we have financed, for example, the expansion of pre-K in Memphis and Shelby County, where we're providing high quality pre-K uh, to about a thousand low income four year olds. Um, what we know about high quality pre-K is that less over obesity. a lifetime, it means less obesity. Um, more uh, better, you know, better adherence to preventive health care visits, uh, more likely to have a medical home. So you're seeing both those short and long term, very direct um, health impacts. You know, additionally, tying it back to COVID, one of the key parts of this pre-K model is also to include uh, wraparound services. Right, it's considered best practices in pre-K that it's not just about the four-year-old, but it really needs to be about the whole family. Well, and what those wraparound services providers are doing, in addition to broadly supporting the family, is they're connecting that family to health services and health screenings. Really important. Come last spring, it was even more important when we saw amongst our families tremendous food insecurity, having very real near-term health impacts. But that family service worker that really is part of the pre-K program was helping to address some of those very uh, direct health issues. So I think that's a great example of how we're thinking about it in terms of the social determinants of health and where there are opportunities um, that both tr change somebody's trajectory in terms of helping folks build the building blocks to move out of poverty, um, but also more directly impact health. Um, another example is around home visiting, right? There's a tremendous amount of evidence that talks about how um, home visiting for at-risk mothers, both sort of prenatally and in the sort of immediate period postpartum, can make a tremendous difference in terms of birth outcomes, in terms of getting building a foundation for health for that child through well child visits and through addressing maternal depression. Yet in spite of that evidence, what we know across the country is that there is tremendous unmet need for home visiting services. We're working in um, a few jurisdictions right now uh, with partners on the ground, including uh, hospitals and home visiting programs and local and state government to help scale those programs. And again, there is a very clear link to less cesarean births, less low birth weight births, but also uh, many of the much broader uh, impacts in terms of those families. 
I also want to sort of circle back to the housing issue because I think housing um, uh, provides an interesting uh, platform, as you as you could say, in part because you know, as Andrea and Kimberly have both very eloquently talked about, housing is sort of a fundamental. And I think some of the opportunity that we have not quite taken advantage of enough is how to help families that have the benefit of safe and affordable housing use that to, um, as a sort of springboard for accessing economic opportunity. And I'm happy to say we are partnering with some progressive affordable housing developers to really talk about how in that moment when you are building the building, how can you think about outcomes financing as a tool to also invest in if it's a rehab, the people who are living in that building, or if it's new construction, the folks in that community um, and help them get access to better jobs, whether through the construction that's going on for the project or other jobs that are in existence uh, for the community. And we think that the develop, particularly when you're thinking about families um, here in New York City, um, over 50% of adults in uh, New York City public housing are unemployed. Um, there is incredible room to have an impact. And so um, one of the things we as a team are exploring is how do you look at that nexus between affordable housing and uh, human services and social services to really use that as a holistic way of um, helping people. Mm -hmm. Well said, lives. Andy. I, I, um, uh, yeah, I agree 110%. And, um, and, you know, I think that, you know, we are seeing a lot of our partners, um, and I mean, our peers, um, you know, focus in this area. Um, you know, I, at one of our, I think it was one of our safe meetings, um, one of our peers said that they are um, now doing some trauma-informed um, care training for their uh, property managers, which I thought was phenomenal. Um, and even thinking about moving that um, same sort of training to their development team so that, you know, it is important to know who our clients are and who we're building for. And, you know, our goal is to, you know, really, um, help rebuild communities. And so it's not just about having the, the, the family or the senior in, a, in, a, in their home, that's important, but it's about the whole nexus, as you said. And so I think that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you added that point. I think that that's a, a great point for us to make sure we double down on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think moving forward, um, ideally, when folks think about developing affordable housing, whether it's for seniors um, or for families or for at-risk individuals, that within that financing is not just the bricks and mortar and that we can no longer afford to say the services are sort of a nice afterthought that we're going to get foundations to come in and pay for. We should be using the same investment approach when it comes to investing the, in the people who live there. I think that's absolutely right. And Andy, you've raised a, a really good point about sort of thinking about the construction and rehab process too, and how you talk about the people that live in the building or in the community and understand what it is they need. One of the challenges for really transformative affordable housing development has been no one wants to pay for that early work. And that is hard work that takes a long time. And so having an expanded group of actors thinking about how do we wrap that into financing and how do we understand that work and, and how do we share what we're doing across platforms too? Because it's not the housing developer is not the only one doing that work. And in good place-based collaborative, it's, it's, it happens, but those aren't everywhere. So how do we really, you know, we're thinking a lot about how do we build that skill in our organizations for every transaction, not just the one that has this great collaborative because we're trying to change a whole neighborhood at once, but how do every time we ask this question? And how do we leverage this moment? We're thinking differently about building housing and having to take new approaches because we're in this pandemic moment and that may create opportunities for thinking about new jobs. Are we gonna use more modular construction or more offsite you know, framing or, you know, just can we move at a different pace or in a different way? Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a moment of both challenge and opportunity here. 
I'm curious, um, Andrea, to that point, um, how COVID is impacting your work now. You know, you said it's a new moment. This is obviously, to use the cliche, unprecedented times. Um, how is how is COVID impacting um, your work in affordable housing? So I mean, I think like everybody, how isn't it impacting it really? Um, in some ways, it's confirming things we always knew, right? How important a stable home is, that if you can be stable and uncrowded, your risk of infection and, and of bad outcomes if it does happen is lower. We are seeing this value of service coordination just really play out. I think Andy raised food insecurity. At the beginning of the pandemic, the role that service coordinators and that our members and their management companies as mission-driven owners played to step in and just make sure that people had food on their plates was enormous. And then it became helping people figure out how do I apply for this unemployment? And am I applying for the right unemployment? And can I get an Alexa because I'm lonely and my grandkids can't visit anymore? Having that, that focus and that person and those connections to community institutions that can help fill those gaps have been really important. On the development side, it's in Kimberly can speak more to this as well. We saw some initial slowdowns, not only because people couldn't work on site, we're now starting to see some of that manifest in supply chain disruptions. There were some early ones, but we're now seeing sort of later stage in disruption as well. And there's been an, it's a sort of evolving challenge with state and local government partners who are working nonstop to try and meet the, the different COVID demands, but are also evolving to processes that were never meant to be remote, like hearings and community engagement becoming remote and an unprecedented strain on their resources. All of that good gap funding and housing incentives and tax abatements are now in jeopardy as communities just don't have the resources they need to meet the public health crisis. So there's a lot of creativity and good partnership happening there, but I think really you are seeing the value of mission-driven and service-enriched housing right now in a way that, you know, we couldn't have written a case study this mm. good in some ways, mm. um, unfortunately. You know, this is how it played out. Yeah, and it's still playing out. And, you know, this is, you know, I think we'll so, be in this environment for a while. Um, and um, it's certainly, whenever that happens, um, it definitely creates um, some uncertainty in the financing market. Um, so, you know, it's hard to sort of predict what that will look like um, when we are, you know, have no idea what, um, what the pandemic looks like over the next um, many months. Um, so, so that's challenging. Um, you know, we had um, we had many senior projects, rehab projects um, underway that were actually under construction when um, in March um, when we went remote um, in response to uh, the pandemic. And you know, we um, I think we responded really well. Um, we learned a lot again from our healthcare side. So, in terms of some of the um, uh, protocols that they were putting in to protect um, the residents. Um, but you know what? What is a stressor for me that we talked about earlier um, is the social isolation piece. And um, our mm -hmm. seniors are, you know, they've gotten a little worked up with that. Um, and that, you know, in a lot of sites, they're very, very active, which is a great thing. And it is exactly the opposite of what we want them to do. You know, having them you know, be socially and physically distant. So um, so it's been really difficult. We, we have some really great property managers that have done, you know, balcony socials and, you know, out the window socials, you know, but it's it's not the same, but we're, we're doing our best. I am sure that we will see many, many, many design standards come out around, you know, COVID. And mm. what that looks like, you know, we're already having conversations about, well, should we ever build another senior property without a balcony? I mean, like, so, um, but, you know, you know, or mm. airflow, you know, I mean, there are going to be things that are just staples, you know, as a result of COVID. Um, but, you know, it's, it's here with us for a while. And, um, you know, but I think that um, there's, there's, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, no good crisis goes to waste or something close to that. Um, and so it has forced us um, to do things that, you um, you know, we're on our list of things to do, but, you know, maybe not the top priority. Um, and so we, yeah. you know, um, very effective. And I think that that will then allow us to um, do more with less, right? So we already operate with a lean machine. 
Um, and now we do even better with the lean machine because you know we went remote and started using all of these tools that we had. So we had access to Zoom, but nobody ever really <laughs> used it. And so now we've become so creative that we're doing, you know, I have construction managers that are doing monthly draw meetings um, remotely. So they're able to, you know, Skype in or FaceTime to the site versus, you know, going to the site, which is, you know, travel expense, which is time and um, and and actually mm -hmm. a, a real field observation, right? Um, so they can do that in other ways. Now you wouldn't want them to do that for 12 months straight, right? But do they need to go every month? So we've started to get really creative in ways that um, we can um, be more efficient with how we work which will allow us to be more productive. Um, so I think from an organizational um, standpoint, we're really excited to, to build on that and not you know, um, let this sort of terrible time sort of um, lose that opportunity in this time. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk on one quick thing that Kimberly sort of brought to light, which is digital inclusion. We have for a number of years been saying, you know, we need to think more about this and the extent to which residents of affordable housing don't have the same access to high speed internet at home that other people do. If they have it, they're reliant upon a smartphone. And then one day we all went home from work and school and it's been eight months. And if you don't have a fully featured device and an in-home connection, not a McDonald's parking lot, not a community center, your ability to access health care, to socialize, to go to school, to do work, to get income supports and nutrition supports is all compromised. So we are thinking in a much more accelerated way, too, about how we build that in and make sure that everybody in a building can have that and about how it pays for itself. I mean, Kimberly, I think, talked some about ways that owners can interact with folks digitally, too, and provide notices. Well, you can do that with rent recertifications and renewals and maintenance requests and all of these things if you just have a fully Wi-Fi equipped building, something we take for absolute granted in a conventional property, but that doesn't normally pencil mm -hmm. on an affordable property. So it seems so basic, but it is, I'm rarely in a conversation where it doesn't come up now. And I know that in terms of, of the health and housing fund, that's one of the areas that we've um, highlighted. And that was even before the pandemic. But I think even now, even more so, just such a, such a necessity and very interconnected to health. Andy, I'm curious, and, and then let's train, uh, turn to the chat question. I'm curious in the work uh, in the paper sex, sex for success project that you're involved in, what impacts of COVID are you seeing there? So two things I would say, one on a macro level, I'm gonna steal Kimberly's phrase of um, doing more with less. Governments across the country are being faced with that crisis. For us, that's a really good value proposition because what we're doing is helping government better align the dollars that they do have. So in a moment when there is less funding, it becomes even more important to align spending with outcomes. Um, as I always say to my teenage son, um, he needs to work smarter, not harder. And that's sort of what we're trying to say to governments is you're funding things and you don't know what we're, you're getting. What you need to do is fund in a way that aligns those two things. So that is sort of our macro picture. And what we are seeing after sort of an initial quiet period is really renewed interest on the part of partners um, in, the, in government to really engage with us. So that's really exciting to be part of delivering services in those communities. On a more micro level, when I talked about our project in Memphis around pre-K, um, as we were heading into year two, that was gonna be largely remote or hybrid, um, in a more typical cost reimbursement structure, the money would have just flowed to the organizations. They, everybody would have in good faith done the best they could. Within the context of outcomes financing, we spent the summer with the providers, the local um, civic organization that is the lead partner, the school district, folks from the county, having really robust conversations of, about what does success look like in COVID, right? What are the things we need to deliver to the families and the kids that can help us hold ourselves accountable to success? Those conversations, I truly believe, 
have led to much more robust offerings for those low income folks in a context when most folks are just muddling through. And so by definition, this construct of paying for outcomes means that everybody has to have a shared definition of success. So for example, in year one, we were focused on attendance. Well, how do you define attendance when school is virtual? Is it logging in for a minute? Is that enough? Can you hold a four-year-old accountable for that? What, one of the things that led us to was a much broader definition of engagement that wasn't just the child, but was also the family. When we talk to the folks on the ground in Memphis, what they would say is that that is something that should always be true, not just for COVID. So in that sense, these conversations are really changing the field, I think much the same way that I think Andrea and Kimberly are mm -hmm. seeing in the world of affordable Yeah, housing. that's really interesting. And, and with the focus on outcomes, uh, you know, we need to have an outcome, but now asking the question again, what does success look like and how, I mean, it's, are in the oh. chat. Um, Evan, oh, did I cut out? Can you hear me okay? You did, but you're back. Oh, good, good. Um, so Evan yeah. um, asked in the chat, have you been able to get the economics to work to fund the services long term? Has it been the county or local hospitals that have committed to this permanent fi uh, financing for the health side? Um, Andrea or Kimberly, um, anything you would want to share around the kind of the longer term financing? I know we touched a little bit on kind of ideas there, but any any examples you'd want to highlight or point to? Yeah, um, I would say that there have been some partnerships um, with um, some, you know, hospitals um, with providers that have um, shared in some of the funding stream. Um, typically, we're seeing that that comes from a public resource. So that mm -hmm. is, you know, um, that's coming from, um, you know, there may be um, what is called sometimes a consolidated um, NOFA or application where a city or state may bundle funding. So they will bundle their um, capital funding, their operating subsidy to help subsidize the units, um, the, the residents rent, and then um, human services. So they bundle that so that the developer would have access to that for its project. So instead of sort of um, piecemealing it together, you could go one-stop shopping for all of your funding. And that's been a very successful program that um, states like Seattle, Connecticut, DC does that, New York does that. Um, so, but, so that's pretty much um, a public resource. Um, we do have a partner, VOA uh, Delaware Valley has had some success with projects in New Jersey um, where they've had some, um, I think one of the hospitals pay in. Yeah, and so you do see partnerships and they tend to be service specific rather than funding for whatever the residents need at the moment. We think a lot about looking to who actually lives there and what do they need and not what do they need one time, but what do they need over the fullness of time. So it might change and that's the challenge. You may find a community hospital that's in it for the long haul and willing to be there doing checkups or preventative health measures that may not be the most valuable thing for those residents. So the challenge has been, what is that source to have that function there to evaluate those needs and connect people to the services and find those partners? Um, there is growing appreciation for the value of that. And we're starting to see some equity investors ask that question and think about how they can structure their investment to at least supplement that piece. Um, our partnership with Fannie Mae and their Healthy Housing Rewards Enhanced Resident Services Program actually offers an interest rate discount that provides a chunk of that money for that service coordination function over time. We start talking about traditional healthcare actors and a lot of other folks that depend on contractual relationships or government funding. You have a horizon problem with housing. Housers think in 15 to 30 year horizons. And if you're talking about MCO contracts, you're talking about three, five years if you're lucky. Um, so those tend to be a little shorter burn and finding that investment that is in funding that that coordination function is what's been really valuable. And, and thankfully we're starting mm. to drive towards that. Yeah, yeah, really great points. And I think from, from my perspective, you know, when I think about services or partnerships, um, 
with housing, uh, oftentimes it's, it's grant-based funding, um, which certainly is not a, a long-term solution. So it's interesting to hear um, some of those other, other examples. Um, Kelly asked, uh, once housing needs are met in a community, what do you think is next, especially for the aging population? I think, Kimberly, you touched on this a little bit um, earlier. Accessible and, inclusion, and accessible and inclusive social and recreational leisure opportunities, perhaps? Um, kind of getting to your social isolation point. Anything else you want to add on on that topic? Um, in terms of um, once a once a senior is um, appropriately housed, um, what's next? Um, so I think um, one of the things that we do is I talked a little bit earlier about our VP of Housing and Healthcare um, in, uh, initiatives um, and looking at um, where we are. So you know. We know that people are, we're going to be serving a neighborhood where, you know, a certain population is going to live. So what are the access and needs in that neighborhood? And so if we focus on that and, mm. um, and you know, decide that, okay, here are some of the um, uh, sort of the gaps that we're seeing and the needs based on the community needs assessment, it's been very interesting to look at those in the neighborhoods that we are starting new projects in. Um, if we can uh, structure our service component around that, and I'm talking about beyond our resident coordinator. So this is about thinking about, um, you know, where we may have uh, designated space, um, which is what we're doing. And um, I think we've got seven projects in the UHC um, Health and Housing Fund. Um, and in each of those projects, we are um, refitting the community space so we have designated space for a healthcare provider to come in and do some, it's not large space, but to do some drop-in um, visits and preventative care. Um, if we can identify what those sort of things are, so what those needs are for a specific population that we believe will live in that community, then I think that that helps, always in addition to the social um, um, elements that we're in programming that we're able to bring. And I don't think that they're, um, I don't think that they sort of um, run down a path. I think we provide that, all of those sort of benefits and assets together. Mm -hmm. Well, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I'm wondering if we uh, might wanna go around quickly and is there are any um, like key lessons learned from um, your experience developing cross-sector partnerships um, what what have they been? What should our audience know? Um, Andy, why don't we start with you? Oh. <laughs> oh, did I put you on the spot? <laughs> I guess I would say that I, you did, but it's okay. I think the foundation of any strong partnership is what I would describe as a value add partnership, where um, each partner has sort of a set of assets and skills that they are bringing to the effort and that uh, where then, what is it? The whole is greater mm -hmm. than the sum of the parts. And, um, you know, what we find when we're working in communities is that we are bringing uh, financial capital and technical expertise. But what we know that we need are community leaders who understand that particular community. They um, understand in a deeper way than we do, as if by way of example, how pre -K, what it means to have high quality pre-K. And so what we find is if you can be aware of what your assets and strengths are and then rely on others, um, that is really when you come to the best outcome. Mm. Maybe that's stating the obvious. But. Well said. Um, Andrea, Kimberly, anything you'd want to share along those lines? You know, I think one of the things we're increasingly hearing and learning is that good partnerships, especially cross-sectoral partnerships, can't be transactional. You've got to be in it for sort of the greater good in the longer haul and not just trying to get a deal over the finish line. I think as a group that you know has its roots in sort of real estate development and developers, that's sometimes a hard moment to get to. But if we're talking about moving the needle on well-being for whole communities, taking a more holistic look and be will being willing to 
you know, be a little mushy around the boundaries of what you're doing and understand you are trying to make an investment, but that it, it's going to take some flexibility and some creativity to get there and not be, as a colleague said, so coin operated mm -hmm. um, is an important lesson. Yeah. So um, I would just add that um, I think it's really important um, because it's not, um, you know, we housers don't, um, we don't have a long history of working with, unless you're in a specific, um, serving a specific population, we don't have a long history of working with um, human service organizations, for example, um, or healthcare, you know, organizations. And so it's not, again, I spoke to this earlier, it's not sort of sort of one of those um, organic natural partnerships that you just think of right away. Um, but I think there is a value proposition that we have for each other. And I think it's key to identify that. And once you identify that, my experience tells me that you always need to then identify a champion. Somebody mm -hmm. that you know, can be the person that, you know, goes to bat for you and really gets it um, and, you know, can help move things through because it's such hard work um, and there's a lot to break down there. So um, it's going to take a lot. It won't happen overnight, but I think there's a lot of possibilities. You know, we've been, you know, making and inching our way towards progress and moving the needle. Um, but I think that as we do more of that, you know, we're going to have to identify more champions and make sure that, you know, we're able to center ourselves around the common, as, as um, Andy said, the common good. So we can't do it all on the housing side, can't do it all on the healthcare side. It only works when we're working together. Yeah, really well said. I, I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is it takes time. And I think that goes to what, what everyone said. It's, you know, when you're building relationships and when you're trying to understand um, different types of programming and different types of organizations, it just takes time to, to understand. And that taking the time to understand, I think, is what um, can help build a strong, strong relationship. Um, and also whether, you know, of course, when there's going to be challenges and help to kind of navigate through challenging times as well. You know, we're, uh, we're over time. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us. And Kimberly, Andrea, Andy, thank you so much for um, sharing your experience with us. Um, really appreciate it and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it's been great.